Let us get started. I will close all my many windows. And there you go. Hi, everybody. There's a lot more people who are here in the last time I look at the screen. Amazing. Hi. I will start off by introducing myself, um, especially for, for those watching on recording. I'm Mel. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong, Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club. What I will do is I'm going to share screen to orient us to our topic. Oh, man. Hold on. Hold on. There was a thing I was supposed to do, and I didn't do a thing. Obviously, I was working on slides with, uh, you know, as we're starting Brain Club. So, hang on. One more thing. Life with a dopamine-bound brain. It's right, a good now. meta, a good meta lesson for. Oh yeah, we're talking about we're we're talking about workplace access needs, because uh, um, I would not say that from this. Um, so all month, of course, we've been talking about spring cleaning, what you're going to let go of that no longer serves you. I actually would not say, Sarah Wilkins, that doing things at the eleventh hour no longer serves me. I'm going to keep that one. I think it serves me quite well. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Jay, did your hair get purple? I love it. Pinkish purple? It looks different in some way. It it may have uh, uh, settled a little bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I got it dyed a while ago, though. Sorry for not noticing till right now. So it looks lovely. All right, here we go. So, um, oh, so Kelly, Kelly uh, is is sharing that I I need a near deadline or I'll work on a one hour project for seven hours. Yeah, no, right. That's um, I think that's how that goes for a lot of pe people. All right, here we go. Letting go of what no longer serves you at work. As always, our community agreement: all forms of participation are okay. You can have your video on or off. And if it's on, we certainly don't expect anything of you. You don't need to look at the camera. You don't need to sit still. You can eat. You can walk. You can stim. You can fidget. You can... Did I say eat already? If I didn't, eat. Um, everyone is welcome here. <laughs> and you can communicate however you'd like to. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. You, you can, you know, you can communicate however you're comfortable. Um, uh, uh, safety comes first here. So in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we uh, endeavor to res respect and protect one another's access needs. And we'll talk more about access needs in a minute. And uh, related to that, um, today is an educational program. It is not medical advice. And we just ask that um, since individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting, um, not a brain club, um, we, 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 we want to um, keep that in mind. However, I will also note that um, when we talk about um, workplace stuff, like people have a lot of workplace trauma and there may be some general, general um trends um, or general themes that we talk about here at Brain Club. Um, so just if there's something that you experienced um, that that you personally experienced as, as traumatic, we just ask that you, you know, just just think about think about the educational piece, think about the audiences of, 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 of kids of all ages, etc. And just um, and and um, and we can go from there. All right. Other bit of access um, to cue safety for a broad range of communication related access needs. We will pause several times throughout Brain Club to give people space and time to enter the conversation however um, they, they, they would like to. And of course, there is never any pressure to like uh, directly, you know, type something or say something at Brain Club. Uh, observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, and um, it is also the case that for many people who may want to um, directly interact, um, sometimes if the conversation goes so fast, like ping pong, um, you know, uh, it's hard to get, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to insert yourself to come to, into conversation. So we will, we'll, 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 we'll pause to give space. Last bit of access. Closed captioning is enabled. You just need to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you can click either the live transcript CC icon or the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. 
or hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. Okay, as I said, continuing our theme, what no longer serves you and letting it go. Um, work, so many things. So um, thank you, Lizzie and Sarah, for finding this beautiful quote. Um, independency is a myth. Truth is interdependency. Right. I think that um, often um, in uh, so, so, so of, of, the, of the many themes that we'll hear about tonight and think about tonight, I think one of uh, uh, a, 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 a one thing that no longer serves many people, um, not just at work, but in life um, is the idea of needing to do things completely independent. Um, because that is glorified from the time you're a little kid and people, you know, clap for you for all the things you do by yourself. Um, and when the truth is autonomy is really important, but independence, doing something entirely by yourself. Oh no. Um, interdependence, being connected to and relying on one to other people in community that that's what we need. So, um, I am going to play for you. We're gonna we're gonna jump right into our panelists, and um, I know that that um, since since uh, the our, our our monthly. So for those who are new ish to Bring Club, um, our third week of the month is uh, usually um, our our monthly neuro inclusive employment related Brain Club, and there's often lots lots of 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 of. Uh, conversation. So we're going to leave lots and lots of time for a discussion. Um, I'm going to play a brief video clip, um, an interview with Sarah and Lizzie from our staff here at All Brains Belong. Um, these are some of the themes you're going to be hearing them speak about. Opting out of urgency culture, which was our theme of February Brain Club. Creating a culture where it is okay to be vulnerable, or it's safe to be vulnerable, creating a culture of interdependence, as I said before, and being transparent around access needs. Just reading in the chat, um, Mia's um, speaking about um, a, a video. Yeah, I don't like the term codependent either. Um, it's different different um uh you know um interdependence is is is, is healthy connections um, relying on other people um this is this is my last minute edition um we, we were a, a a group last night we were talking about communicating or just about like you know how do you access needs at work access needs in 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 daily life um what's a framework for thinking about that so access needs, when we use that term, um, thinking about anything that anyone needs to fully and meaningfully participate in their experience. And we all have access needs. It might be something in the physical environment. It might be an emotional access need, a um, a, a communication related access need, a, you know, a, 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 a physical mobility related access need. We all have access needs. Um, it's just that for um, uh, Many of us, um, we are less likely to have our access needs met by the defaults of society. So one framework for thinking about communicating around access needs, um, you might not, um, I, 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 I often quote um, a member of our ABB village who once said, I don't know what my needs are. I just know they're not being met. So, if I were to say, hey, what are your access needs? You may not know. Um, but sometimes thinking about it in terms of, well, what's stressful or what's fatiguing, what's exhausting, you know, like what's what's not working or when do I feel terrible and what just happened before that? And then maybe um, uh, having some hypotheses, some guesses about why that was stressful or exhausting or dysregulating or, you know, whatever, um, of just some possibilities of why that might be. And then, and only then, can we then problem solve about what would maybe make it less stressful or less fatiguing. And then, you know, lastly, how do I tell people? And um, uh, so, some, consider so, some considerations there. Um, what's the objective in telling people? Is the objective to get something changed? Is the objective to be understood? Is the objective to change minds? Is the objective to forge a relationship? That's all going to depend on how you tell the people and, of course, the 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 audience.
Oh, sorry. I did not scroll up far enough to see Kat's comment about, I do think that people get independence mixed up with autonomy. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So um, I'm going to play for you an interview um, with uh, Sarah Wilkins, our community programs coordinator, and Lizzie Pratt, our education programs coordinator. Um, and to show them how much I trust them, I have not watched this video yet. Mel, I don't know if you're seeing in the chat. We're not sure recording is happening. Oh, thanks. Culture of interdependence right there. Recording in progress. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, let me get video going. Share with sound. So today we're talking about spring cleaning at work, and I thought it would be um, helpful to record a conversation between myself and Lizzie. Lizzie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lizzie, and um, I'm the Education Programs Coordinator. And I use she, her. And I'm Sarah Wilkins. I use she, they, and I'm the community programs coordinator for All Brains Belong. So today we're talking about spring cleaning at work and we're brainstorming, kind of letting go of past uh, beliefs and kind of figuring out how to make our days and our weeks flow um, as best as we can. And um, one of the things that we were just talking about was um, the logistics of day to day work that we do and uh one of the things and just trying to identify sort of what's stressful and how can we uh reduce that or eliminate that or reallocate that um that role and so even though something might seem small lizzie and i were just talking about how like it can be sort of a low level stress that can um be really sometimes not even noticeable it's just sort of there um, but if we can eliminate those things and find different ways to do them, um, it can really make a difference. So, Lizzie, do you want to talk about the Ethernet cable a little bit and what that means? Yes. Um, so, when I looked at my week, I realized that um, the Ethernet cable that I use um, for the Brain Club videos, I'm usually in charge of um, having the Ethernet cord for the videos for them to run smoothly. And I realized that um, the timetable of making sure that I'm ready to go at Brain Club um, with the cord um, and getting my kids settled um, right after school is a little challenging. And I realized that because it's important to me that um, I'm not pushing urgency culture on my kids. Um, we do school pickup right before brain club. So um, I'm trying really hard not to um, have my kids be in the urgency culture mindset when we try to get home and then I'm getting them settled and then I go straight into brain club. So I realized that I probably need to have a little bit more uh, buffer time in my schedule and um, I was hoping that we could brainstorm together um, about the Ethernet cable. Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a great example because it's something that somebody could say like, oh, this this is just one thing that needs to happen, the Ethernet cable. But that how the ca has a cascade effect on your life and on your life as a parent outside of your role and work. And um, and if we can figure out a different way to do it, then we should, you know, because you don't, there's no reason that it has to be you that streams the videos. So, you know, it led to a conversation where we were kind of brainstorming, is there a volunteer that could do this? Or could we, you know, find someone that would be willing to um, take this on or sign up for this task? 
And I think that that's totally doable. And so that's why, you know, I love our um, culture at ABB. We talk a lot openly and transparently about the things that are challenging for us um, <clears throat> so that we can body double with each other if it's something that's um, maybe just we have an, a, a task that we could use support on. Um, and we can, you know, just be open about the things that are hard um, so that we can spring clean them and kind of, figure out how to, to feel as good as we can feel and, and, you know, be able to productively do the things that we need to get done. Um, so yeah, we talk about that. And I love how you talked about buffer time. Um, you know, I think that it's so easy to just like go, go, go. And um, building in time to give ourselves space to take care of ourselves, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes in between the go, go, go. Um, is such a critical thing with urgency culture, you know, like you were saying, you don't want to have that for your kids, but, ha but not having it for yourself too. Yep. And, th and that's why I realized when I was thinking about, um, spring cleaning during my week that, okay, let's bring up the ethernet cable that it's okay to bring it up, you know, even though it seems so small that I don't have to put urgency culture on myself. Um, and that, you know, my team's going to be there for me and that we're interdependent and we yeah. can problem solve together. Yeah. 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 And another way that I think of our spring cleaning has been, um, taking all the different buckets that make up ABB and creating task analysis for each of the things that need to happen, um, so that we can identify like, who's the best person to do this task. Um, we don't have to hold it all in our head of all the things that need to happen. Um, and everything that we're doing, we're trying to document and put into, you know, Google Docs with links. And so everything is kind of cleanly organized. And I think that that's um, been really helpful for everybody to know where everything lives and how to access it um, and how to document it so that the next time we go to do an event, we did an event recently um, and it went really well and there wasn't really a lot that I would change, but there were a few things. And so, you know, making a point of, um, you know, noting that and putting it into a doc so that next time we go to do an event, we don't have to think about the things or find the, you know, the legal pad that had its chicken scratched on there, but we have it actually in a doc, you know, our event, um, our event document, you know, so I think having, um, Having the task analysis stuff that we've been doing, that's been really helpful as well. Um, yeah, and I think another thing that, you know, comes out of the discussion around like spring cleaning is being just realistic about what we can expect of ourselves in an eight hour day. Um, and I think it's, we all have really strong work ethics, which is really good, but it also can be challenging because um, you can tend to, uh, overexert yourself and you know that has implications for your health and so being realistic about you know again it ties into urgency culture right like not feeling like everything has to happen exactly when it's on a to-do list it's okay if it waits a day or two it'll be okay <laughs> this is a work in progress for me i know it's a work in progress for you because it's yeah. a balance like between family and work and finding you know, enough hours in the day. And we were just saying like, it's messy. Like we're in the middle of the messiness still. We don't have it yeah. dialed in. <laughs> no, we don't. And, oh. um, Go ahead. um, oh, I, I think, um, I think just how, um, we've created the systems and the visual supports and the task analyses, um, that's really helped me, um, just, have a smoother day and also helps me feel less overwhelmed when I am going through the messy and reorganizing my to-do list or reprioritizing. It just takes a lot of the cognitive load off yeah. of my mind, having yeah. those systems and visual supports. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think having containers for stuff is really helpful um, because I think it can be easy to just chase after all these different things that, you know, that it's kind of unrelated, but having a sense of the bigger picture of kind of what your theme is for your week or your theme for your month, um, you know, that that's a really helpful piece of things. Um, and I think just, 
again, the culture of interdependence in my mind is, is the ultimate spring cleaning. Coming back to the idea that we, you know, we rely on one another and that that's not only okay, it's encouraged. And I think that that is a spring cleaning kind of thing when you're talking about a workplace because that's unusual, I think. In my experience, it's fairly unusual to be quite so transparent about, you know, areas that are challenging and, and asking support and figuring out if there's another way to do something. So um, I think that concludes our conversation. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lizzie, for chatting with me about this topic. And um, all for now. That is lovely. Thank you both so much. And it's just really, it's, 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 it's interesting because at the beginning, when Lizzie shared the example of a seemingly small thing, and she's talking about the, the Ethernet cable and the rushing before Brain Club. Um, Lizzie, you call it small, but it wasn't small to you. And I think so many people get the message growing up their whole lives that having needs is bad. And like, it, it, like just the, the, the uh, feeling apologetic for having needs um and um and, and 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 many of the people who work here have when they've shared various access need things along the way they, they've all used this phrase that's so interesting um and it's a phrase that's used commonly is that i don't want anyone to think that i'm not a team player that is a spring cleaning. Leave that one behind. Um, because I think that you actually can be part of an interdependent team and have needs. You can do both. You can. And that's not the messaging out there in neuronormative life. And I'm scrolling up. Uh, Kelly says, I use the shopping list feature on Alexa to cognitively unload through the day. And then I sort through it when I have the time. Oh, like on the app, you mean? Yeah. So I have an Alexa in my room and she's got a shopping list feature. So you can say add blah, blah, blah to my shopping list. Well, okay. I do that with things that I don't want to forget. So it's like add call so-and-so to my shopping list, add don't forget to feed the fish to my shopping list. And then I'll go through later on. So the Jeez. little things are in the back of my mind. This is amazing. Also, how do you review it? Are you reviewing the visual, like on the app of what it took from you? Or are you having it play it back to you? You can do either. I look on the app. I have a spot that says shopping list and it will have everything. And if you click on it, like you've done it, it disappears, but it will leave everything you haven't clicked on. So you can kind of go through and do them as you want. And still, I just find when I'm so focused on trying not to forget things, it slows my cognitive processing so much through the day. You yep. absolutely. Um, I, 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 I think I'm at any given time using like 75% of my brain power to remember something, rehearse it over and over. And then I forget it anyway. Um, so I love that. I love that idea. Um, Kat says in the chat, you don't want to be needy. Um, uh, right. And you get feedback works well with others like that generic, that generic feedback. Right. Um, and, and at our, at our staff retreat in the fall, we talked about, um, and I, maybe I've shared the Supreme Club before. I don't know. Um, sorry. I, I think I become a person who tells the same story over and over again. Um, but um, uh, we talked about um, in, in an access needs framework, talking about core values of how it's important for us to be perceived um, and core values, like core anti-values of how it's important to not be perceived. And so often... Um, those things guide so much of our interpersonal interactions. So if I have a core value of being perceived as a team player, 
there are going to be situations I find myself in that I like stuff something or I cortically override my limbic system in order to make sure that that value being perceived this way happens. Um, and, um, you know, uh, on the flip side, if if someone gives feedback or something happens that it implies feedback of the core anti-value, like for me, um, it's uh, it's really important to me to not be perceived as a hypocrite really important to me to not be perceived as a micromanager, not be perceived as um, rigid and inflexible. These are like all the things that I've been told my whole life that I am. So like the, the, these, 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 these stories, these narratives get like laid down really early in life. Um, and that's, they, they, they often result in things that we work really hard to not project to the world. Um, and there is some truth to a lot of them um, uh, in, in you know, so so when that mirror happens, um, those are the conflicts I get myself into because I'm dysregulated by those things. And knowing that is an important part of access needs. I wonder. Um, uh, oh, yeah. So Kat says, Hit it, hitting on building a mask and even rejection sense of dysphoria, right? Feeling rejected when being misperceived. Yep. Um, and uh, Kelly says, uh, I the thing is jumping. I thought I had grown so much, right? Because because the, the message is that to grow up means to like no longer have access to Like it just, yes, right. So I, I, I love your use of quotes there. But then someone tried to help me meet a need last weekend and I mentally freaked. Um, they wanted to send me to a conference in person, um, uh, much more money rather than online because it is easier for me to be in person than more rigid corporate Zooms. And I freaked out about the kindness. I don't know why or how, how to be better about it. Um, and and I, 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 I wonder if and, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people spend a lot of cognitive power trying to fix something as opposed to just naming it and noticing it. Like, hey, I'm having a hard time when people are kind or I'm having a hard time when people make changes on my behalf or I'm just I'm finding that uncomfortable. And maybe you don't need to be better about it. I mean, maybe. Um, just, and just, just, it's, it's, it's not just you. It's, it's like everyone, like it's, 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 uh, I, I just think there's a lot of cognitive effort that goes into fixing and changing and continuously self-improving, um, that might be better spent in, in other, in other ways. I wonder for, 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 for others, um, are there, um, are there other things that you've been thinking about maybe letting go of? Um, thoughts, attitudes, narratives. Kelly says, I hid my autism for 35 years. I became open to help the cause. Meaning you became open about being autistic um, to help the cause. Yeah, reduce the stigma. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you, quote, still freak out randomly. Is it random or is it related to your access needs not being met? Even if not in that moment, like, but, you know, if you, if you spend a whole day not having your access needs met and then you, you know, you flip your lid, you know, later that day, like that's potentially still related to all the things that you endured all day long, for example. Well, I think it's that I'm so used to hiding my access needs and not wanting anyone to figure it out that now when people try to, to meet my needs, I feel like, I don't know, uh, I, I just sometimes I freak out about that, like when I'm so used to working in really non-inclusive places, and I'm not saying my workplace is great yet, but they're trying to be better every day. And when someone tries to help me or tries to meet my needs, it feels like, it sounds ridiculous, but it feels like somehow I'm not as strong as I used to be, or like I'm giving in or, you know, all those cultural stereotypes of what it means to be like a hard worker or a good person. Yep. Um, has, has anyone else experienced that? 
Oh, yep. Cat has. I think I feel that, Kelly, when someone tries to help me, it feels infantilizing. It's not, but that's the feeling. Yeah, I think I, 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 and, and it, 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 it may, I mean, there may be some, you know, um, energetic vibe thing that you're picking up on, um, about, about, about the helper. I agree. Definitely not ridiculous. Um, definitely relatable. So Sierra shares something very interesting there that PDA plays a part too. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah, I think um, I, for instance, if I'm feeling very anxious and my wife is like, oh, why don't you go for a walk? That always makes you feel better. Why don't you do this? That always makes you feel better. And I'm like, no, you don't, you don't know me. Put up on my walls. Absolutely. No, you're putting a demand on my autonomy and I'm going to say no. Um, And so I think that somebody helping can sometimes be at least for me perceived as somebody putting a demand on me. Um, even if the demand is you should feel better because you look like you're really anxious. Yup. And I think the um one of one of the things that that um and 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 CV says um uh something that I was I was really about about to think about. So thanks for thanks for connecting that. Um sometimes Unconsciously, I worry I will owe in return if someone meets my needs. So that doesn't come from nowhere. That's what goes on. And when you when it happens even once, that stays in your limbic system. So there's all kinds of things around that. Um, or or even, you know, uh Sierra in Sierra's example, I mean, um uh Many people who make a suggestion about how someone could feel better, um, uh, the vibe of those experiences in the past, that stays with you too. And then it's, you know, even if it's a safe bucket person who says it now, it reminds your limbic system of the time that an unsafe bucket person said that. Or says, I feel like I distance myself from friends sometimes for this reason. Like, I feel like I don't have the bandwidth to be what I view as a good friend um, or what you've been what you've been told equals good friend. Um, So I don't want them to treat me that way. So I don't feel bad for not being able to reciprocate. That is real. Yes. And Kat says, I was thinking that too. So many people have been that way, only doing it for me in order to have something to hold over me so that I can be expected to return the favor someday, right? That's how a lot of people live their lives. Jade says, sometimes I just want to be mad without people feeling like they should need to cheer me up. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, it's interesting. Um, Sometimes when Luna flips her lid and I try, I try to quote support her, but I'm really actually invalidating her by trying to fix a problem that she, anyway, later on when we're, when we're, we're recovering and we're debriefing and I'll be like, next time, what do you want me to do? Nothing. What do you want me just to like sit here and do nothing? Yes. Okay. And being transparent around my access needs around that, it, even with a very young child, like I worry that if you fall and trip and I don't come over to you, I worry that you're going to think that I don't love you or I don't want to help you or I don't want to be there for you. I worry you're going to think that. She's like, I'm going to think that. You would just be actually respecting my autonomy, mama, she says. Um, so, so it's, it's, um, I think it's just transparency is the way out of chaos. Kelly says, I try to ask now when someone's mad, try to help, do you want a listener or a helper? Yeah. Asking people what role that they want you to play, um, is really, it's, it's, it's basically asking them what their access needs are. It's a very thoughtful question. Um, Kelly says, I've noticed part of the masking process for a lot of us is almost, is almost going purposely against our needs. So we show, quote, no weakness. 
In fact, with the teams I work with, that's a huge red flag that people aren't okay. But I think many of us do it. Yes. Yes. Travis, I love that book. So Travis has a, a book uh, uh, posted, The Rabbit Listened. That is such a beautiful book. Um, yes. Stevie says, sometimes unconsciously, I worry I will owe in return if someone, oh, I just read that. It, it hops. When we're doing the commenting thing, it like keeps the thread together. And then, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, Laura said, I had a friend group called themselves the 2 a.m. friends group that we could count on each other to be there even in the middle of the night. And I couldn't. I turn off my ringer at bedtime. I left that group. I couldn't even tell them why, because I felt like such a horrible friend. Yeah. So related to that, um, I remember in early COVID, I remember healthcare providers talking about um, you know, this is my calling. This is what I was trained for. Like, this is, you know, I'm here to sacrifice myself for the greater good. I remember being like, I don't feel that way. This feels so unsafe. But like the narrative, like the, the, the self-shame around like, I'm a terrible person who like wants to stay alive. I'm a terrible person. Um, so like, but that's, that's, that's what goes on. It's the narratives of like what a good person is as though there's one right way to be that. Thanks for the solidarity, Laura. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah says, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, but that's like, and this is what, this is what people talk about. And I don't know who knows, who knows if it's what Kelly said, which is the, I'm scared out of my mind. So I'm going to tell the story about how I'm going to, I'm going to address my cognitive dissonance by this is the thing and like tapping into whatever to get through that. I mean, there's pro probably is, is a component of that for some people, maybe not for others. Um, but yes. So, you know, I, 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 I wonder, um, cause you know, many people have, have described that, you know, there's access needs that you, you know, you, you've not been able to communicate and, it, the that that dissonance is is so uncomfortable that you have to leave leave relationships are uh, has anyone had the experience of how do you know when when it's okay to communicate your access needs and you know for many people they don't they don't have environments like that or relationships like that And it may not be something you know, it might be something you feel. Kelly says, uh, teachers have that same superhero martyr thing sometimes. Um, movies movies um, with, with, with cancer patients grading papers from the hospital bed. Society puts a lot on us. Yeah, we all have to juggle so many hats and there's a lot of guilt. Kat says, it's how healthcare professionals are expected to answer messages 24 seven for free. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I remember at Brain Club once, um, uh, there was a, 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 a participant who shared a story about um, how awesome one of their healthcare providers um, uh, was for dropping everything and coming in to evaluate a problem like on a Sunday night in the middle of the night or something. I remember being like, no, no. Um, and Sierra and I, we, we debriefed afterwards. Cause I, so I did the thing, I did the Brene Brown thing where I was like, I feel shame right now. So I'm going to call Sierra and be like, Sierra, I feel shame, shame. And, 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 uh, and, and, and it was so helpful because what Sierra said was like, yeah, that story. No. Um, and so that was, I remember, I, I, remember, I remember that that was really, I mean, I really felt, I felt, I felt shame during the Brain club. Yep. Kelly says, uh, I love your auto email reply. Good example of communicating accesses. Oh yeah, my auto reply that says, I'm never responding to an email ever because I can't read them because I have 771 unread emails right now. Yeah, that, yes. No, I mean, I was very, it's very interesting that you say that because I remember when I first put that up many months ago, um, I, I was so anxious about, again, related to core anti-values. It is really important to me to be perceived 
as approachable and accessible and flexible and available and all of those things. And like, yeah, if I wasn't doing 50,000 things, I might be those things. Um, but I worried that the email auto reply like would send this, this signal of like, I'm a rigid person who is not prioritizing you. Um, but over time, I think the, it, it really became like when you zoom out and you say like, like what Sarah said um, in the in the video around like being realistic about what is a human actually able to do in a single day, and that the, there's a finite capacity to that. I mean, that's my 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 thinking around that shifted. Laura, Mel, I feel like you've modeled that so well for so many of us. Like I'm thinking of doing research with community members and being really it being really important to me to meet people's access needs and it being beyond my capabilities to feel like I could do all the things I had to do to meet other people's access needs. And I feel like being able to model and share my own and be transparent about what my needs are was actually a better process than trying to ignore my own needs to meet the needs of others. And I feel like that's a skill you've walked the walk of and helped a lot of us understand, I think. Thank you, Laura. And I think, you know, in the in the example, since, you know, I, since I, I collaborate on, on projects with you, I think that um, what you've modeled for the people you work with is transparency. I think when people are transparent about your access needs and you frame it around access needs, I have an access need that X, I have the kind of brain that needs Y, like, what are people going to do? No, I don't care about your access. I don't, I don't care that you actually don't have what you need to meaningfully and fully participate in your life. Like, who's going to say that? And if they do, like, that is so reflective on them, not you. Uh, reading in the chat, Kelly says, uh, we need to accept that we all have different brains. That healthcare worker might be actually cool with the Sunday. However, it's also also okay to not be okay with that. And we need to get over the guilt of our needs because there are things that um, we are more comfortable with than others would be. Yeah. Um, CV says, thank you for touching on this. I've been experiencing shame and anxiety as I explore boundaries more and saying no categories. Yes. That's nailing it on the head. You know, I think that's that, that setting boundaries, it's going to piss people off. Um, and this is about access. If setting a boundary is saying, I don't care about you and your access needs, well, then that's, you know, then, yeah, but that's not what you said. You said, I have access needs and here's what they are. If someone's going to shame you for that, like, oh. Kat says, you find out who people are when you set boundaries. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, Sarah, that's like when we met with Chris Dorman and he said, boundaries are an opportunity for an exchange of information Ooh. Um, of, if, of, of, of really, if a, if, if a boundary is around an access need, we're going to learn, we're going to learn what that access need is. And a lot of times, um, when, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like when we, We've talked about the Supreme Club right, where we say that if my goal is to meet, my, have my access needs met without infringing upon the access needs of someone else, often when someone flips their lid, when a boundary is set, it, it may be because their own access need was not met, but they didn't know about it that way. And rather than just zooming out and saying we have conflicting access needs here it's the shame thing of like there's something about you that is wrong because you because you told me you had needs kelly says there's also the issue of positive reinforcement that's what gets me when people compliment me for doing so much it makes it harder to set boundaries because i chase the endorphin rush of the compliments mm -hmm. it's also okay to have an access need for external validation um and so to make to, 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 to name that for people, actually, when we, we, um, there's somebody that, that, uh, a, a consultant of ours who, when we, we started a framework of asking everyone we work with, even if you're not an employee, um, we, we, we started the process of asking like 
anyone, even our independent contractors, like what are about their access needs? And we asked people, we asked this one person about access needs related to like, not just task assignment or like communication during a task, but, but access needs around after a project. And they shared that they really, um, are, are they, they, they have an, they have an access need to know that they had an impact, to know that the effort they made had meaning and what a beautiful thing to share. And we kept that in mind. Um, I mean, we were going to, we would, we would have, you know, made a, made a big deal about the thing when the project was done anyway, but like, but, but, but we, 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 it was such an easy thing to do to meet that need once we knew about it. And it's a need that so many people have and they can't name and they're shamed for having. Um, I certainly, I, like, like, uh, you know, if, 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 if I, if I say something, you know, my, my, anything, my, my husband will often be like, here's a pat on the head and like a kind of a, like a, in like a, you know, a mocking kind of way, but I've had a next, I've had a need for, I've had a need for external validation like my whole life. And it's just, it's, 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 it's not external validation. It's like, I need to know where I stand because if I don't, I'm going to spend, I'm actually going to spend my cognitive resources spinning around to wonder whether I'm safe Safe or not safe, I can't tell. And when you tell me you like me, I feel a little bit safer right now, um, or something like that. I think I think there's a lot. Sarah says same. Kelly says I started asking my students about access needs after coming to Brain Club. That's awesome. I tried to do it before, but this has helped me have a smoother and more clear conversation. And employer training needs to to learn this too. Yeah. So so um, most of our um, you know to date most of our you know neurodiversity and inclusion trainings that we do are neuroinclusive employment. And um, when access needs for staff comes up, staff the attendee is tend to really engage with that of like, oh yeah, my needs are not, oh yeah, they're not really being met. How now we have a framework for talking about that? Cool. Um, and, and it's, and it's really, um, it's, it's, it's like when you think about how, you know, there's in all different industries and all different fields, um, there's, it's, 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 there's, there's just, it's so common that people are like quitting their jobs or if they're in a job, they're so aware of the mismatch between either the culture or the tasks and the way their their brain works or the way they you know their their priorities are and it's it's um access needs play out into all of it um amy says validation helps me know where i am in space and time safety yep yep Kelly says, I love that you normalize that um, it's something that everyone needs to think about, not just neurodivergent people. Oh, absolutely. It's all people. We all have access needs. We all have to think about it. It's just that depending on what you're, you know, if, 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 if you're the one in five people who learns things and or communicates in a way that significantly departs from like the, the, the pretend tip typical brain or the de pretend default brain. There is no default brain, but the way that like the defaults that society caters to, um, yeah, you're less likely to have your access needs met by default without intentional design or thinking about this. Kat says, when being praised for something, I used to have a really negative reaction. What do I do with that praise? Um, yeah, like, what are, what are you expecting of me? Um, I've learned about praise and PDA. Now I say I both hate praise and need it. Yes. Um, I hate that it feels demanding. And then I kind of know, I kind of like the validation of how I'm pleasing people. And if my unmasked self is doing the pleasing, like I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting praise for authentically me as opposed to praise for my mask. Yeah. Um, uh, Luna says, and actually, um, I heard Christy Forbes say this. So uh, Christy Forbes, for, for who don't know, is a, is a, is a PDA educator and advocate. Um, there was a lot of amazing um, uh, materials out there, um, but I heard Christy Forbes say on a on a YouTube video um, around when you praise me, I feel pressure to do that thing again, and that's the demand. So I said, "Hey Luna, I heard Christy Forbes say this thing," and you know, just stopped. I didn't ask a question; just stopped. She thought about. It. She's like. 
Oh, yeah. That's how it is for my brain, too, Mama. Good information. Yeah, Kat says that's where I got it, Christy Forbes. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's um it's it's uh and there's a there's a term for this. Um um uh, I always forget what the term is. It's uh social penetration theory. I understand my experience better when I hear it from someone else. So like I hear someone say something, I read someone writing something, now I understand my own life experience better. Ellie says validation is so important for people that can't always pick up on micro expressions or body language, right? It's the, um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like, um, you know, um, I have the kind of brain that doesn't, I mean, it's a, a lot of autistic people are hypermobile and, um, and, and proprioception feedback from your muscles, joints, ligaments of where your body is in space and back to the brain. If you're extra, if you're, if you have joint hypermobility, um, you don't get that signal until you're in a more extreme position. So if you're not in that position, you don't, your brain doesn't actually get the signal. So let's, let's, that's, and that's, um, that's, hypermobility is more common in, in neurodivergent people. And so there's a lot of like, well, I'm always moving because that's how I feel my body. Or um, if not, that's maybe why I'm walking into the wall or why I knock stuff over all the time. Cause I have no idea where my limbs are um, until I, until I hit the thing. Um, and, and I think that there's emotional, it's like, it's like, it's a, it's, it's emotional feedback. It's relational feedback as opposed to physical feedback. Kelly says, is that where I don't know where my limbs are? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Laura says, I have learned that one of my access needs in the workplace is external validation. Right. You need to know you're doing a good job. You need to know that, you know, you're, especially, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think a lot of people also never, like, you, 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 you can't tell whether, whether someone's pleased with your work and if it feels unsafe to for someone to be displeased with your work, if that feels unsafe, or if even like I've worked in places where I don't get feedback at all and neutral feedback is like, it may as well be like, you're displeased with me. Um, and, and there's that narrative around like, you should be self-sufficient. You should be self-praising. It's like, no. Um, when I think about like, you know, it's just, it's, you shouldn't need that. Who are you to tell me what I should or should not need? This was hard. Um, uh, Kat says, so that's autistic communication, finding how it resonates, connection with others through shared experiences, deeply understanding something you're saying because I have experienced something similar. Oh, you're going back to the the, the social penetration theory. Yeah. Um, or if not some similar, you can tell me that I didn't quite get it right and, and get feedback that way. Yeah. So as we, as we wrap up today, I wonder, especially just to create some space for anyone who has not had a chance um, to, to share. And again, no pressure to do so. I just wanted to make, give that space. Laura says, I have a boss who really focuses on areas in need of growth without recognizing areas where I'm doing well. And I had a really hard time with that until I just named it for myself and stopped internalizing that as her being unhappy with my work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a balance, right? Like, I think there's a, there's, um, you know, it's all about access needs, right? So the balance is, you know, you're, you know, if, 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 if we're saying that in a given workplace, I recognize I have access needs in the workplace. My supervisor, my employer has access needs in the workplace. They may not know that or they may not have that framework. The organization I work for also has access needs and all of those things need to be balanced. Um, and in a world of, of, of a world of goodness of fit, those, those things can be talked about and negotiated. And if not, then maybe the person recognizes, hey, this is this is actually not this is not working for me. This is not. But again, that's a layer of privilege, right? A layer of privilege should be like I have I have the privilege of actually getting to pick where I work or what or what work I'm doing. 
Um, and, and, and that's, that's also very hard about this. So it's like, how do I, how do I potentially meet my own access needs um, without, without requiring or without, um, you know, with, with, without requiring chain or we're not, without, not, not requiring someone to not have their access needs not met. Like that's the, that's the balance. Kelly says, I expect many of us experienced a lot of hyper micro criticism as youngsters. And maybe that plays into needing constant dialogue of how well we're doing, getting over that trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and also, you know, for, um, I can say as, as a former child who received that, that, um, I find that inadvertently I am repeating it with my own child um, because I either want to, I'm afraid I am wanting to protect her from negative social emotional experiences that I had, or I'm uh, as a PDA or I, when I see autonomy violated in it, when I flip my lid, it feels unsafe. Um, so uh, that's, it's, it's, you know, if I, if, if I just, for example, at a, at a, at a Aubrey's Belong kids group yesterday, um, Luna was powering over someone else and um, Hannah Bloom, the OT on our uh, board of directors, she, she asked Luna, she said, do you have an access need to control someone right now? And I was like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah. And then Luna, like, I mean, she thought about it. She was like, Yes, that is my access need. And it 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 they it was it was amazing because then Hannah's like, yeah, um, I'll play the game. I'm I'm I, I give consent to the game you're trying to play. I will play your game. Those folks, they have not given consent to that game. And it was like it was truly navigating access needs. It was it was beautiful. And Kat says, not everything has to be a teachable moment. Yeah, I'm trying to like teach constantly, right? So that, so thanks for naming that. Yes. So um, uh, uh, we, 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 we spoke a lot about safety tonight um, and uh, as, we, as we often do, and which reminds me to tell you that next week is, it's, I don't know how this happened, but it's already the end of March and we will be having our next book chat. We'll be um, uh, chatting about un the book Unmasking Autism by Dr. Devin Price. And again, no pressure to read the book. Um, I have not read the book yet. I'm going to be facilitating the talk. And I think I actually, I mean, I, I really actually want to read this book. I've been wanting to read this book for a year. It's been like on my shelf for a year. Anyway, um, but I'm still going to come. I'm going to come to myself, even if I don't read the book. So I hope you do too. So um, I will hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.